And I love how uh, uh, how Peter manages to get uh, Jameson uh, photos of Spider-Man for the Daily Bugle. And that one moment where he stops the thieves from robbing an armored car. And, and how he sets up the camera using his web. And didn't you say something that uh, how you questioned that as a kid? Yes. Uh, you see... When I first saw this movie, I was very young. There was a lot of action sequences I liked, but also a lot of dialogue or events that I didn't really understand. Yeah. So it took me time to figure it out. But I found out a while back that, you see, the way that Peter does it is, obviously, since he's Spider-Man, he can't be in two places at once. So what he decides to do is a little... Set up a timer. Right. He's a little creative. He webs up his camera at a various angle for a good view shot, sets the camera on timer and sets it to automatic so it will take the pictures itself while he's in the frame taking out bad guys. Yeah, which is pretty clever. And of course, when he, when we do get the moment with him giving the photos to JJ, I mean, of course, they're crap, 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 mega crap. Give me 200 bucks for all of them. That seems a little low. Take them somewhere else down. <laughs> <laughs> This, he's just so perfect, and even when he when Peter asks him for a job, he's like, "No jobs, freelance. Best thing in the world for a kid your age. Bring me some more shots of the newspaper selling quail. Maybe we'll take them off your hands. But never say you have a job. Beat. Send a nice pack of Christmas meat. That's how they do. Get out of here and bring me more photos. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, really, the way that guy is, you just both love him and you hate him in some cases at the same time. It's just. It's unbelievable. That guy really is J. Jonah Jameson. Another good part in the film that I personally enjoy right after J. Jonah Jameson, I mean, he's hilarious, yeah. is the Unity Day Festival that they have right after the board meeting at Oscorp. It's, like, really fun. It's unbelievably festive, you know, like yeah. there's just pop culture references all over the place, a little yeah. hip-hop beat. Yeah, especially with Major Gray. Yeah, I mean, seriously, nice choice that point. Oh, but, yeah. Uh, and, uh, of course, we get the big introduction to the Green Goblin. Mm hmm But right before that, we also get to see Peter kind of taking photos of things around. and. Yeah, right before the Green Goblin shows up. Yeah, and he notices Harry and MJ on the balcony. Yeah. Right before the Goblin shows up and begins to understand a few things. And... Yeah. Then, one thing I did want to touch on on this scene was Peter doing the shirt rip of almost a bit to pay a homage to Superman because Sam Raimi often said that, I mean, the Superman movies from the 70s and 80s were a big inspiration for him on how to approach his Superman movies because, like I mentioned before, Peter ripping off his shirt, I mean, as a good homage to how Clark did the same thing with Superman. Mm -hmm. And... They have, like, familiar plot beats, and even when he rescues uh, MJ from falling to her death, it almost feels, like, almost similar to the helicopter rescue in the first Superman movie back in 78. Yeah, when Superman kind of saved Lois from falling a thousand feet. No. Yeah. But, but even around that point, that was quite the battle, you know. They, you have Spider-Man swinging up after his little encounter with the Goblin on the balloons, then... Well, well not only that, but, I mean, I mean... Now, when it comes to the CG effects of the on the Green Goblin, I mean, uh, the, like I mentioned before, I mean, there are some bits of the CG where it looks like something that you're seeing from a video game. It almost looks a bit like an unfinished effect, but it looks better as a video game cutscene. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, mostly with the moments with... Uh, uh, you can tell that it's computer-generated and it looks a little bit fake, and... I mean, but the ones that are practical, I mean, I mean, what ones that are, I mean, when you see, like, the action, like, actually there, and instead of, like, something, like, like using the computer, and, like, you can tell, okay, yeah, that's computer, that's computer, that's computer, <laughs> and, yeah, but the, the in-camera action, I mean, uh, most of, uh, some of the action, I mean, that's done in-camera, that I really like, and, and, uh, the, especially, like, the, I mean, the one moment with Spider-Man, I mean, uh, when it comes to the CG dated, uh, the moments with Spider-Man jumping on the balloons to try to save MJ, 
And even after he disables uh, uh, the Green Goblin glider, and, and of course he says, Well, it made again, Spider-Man. <laughs> yeah, that's like classic villain line. And even before that, I personally enjoyed the little part there where Goblin turns around right before that and is about to fire the turrets on him, and Spider-Man just turns around and webs him in the face. It's just hilarious, you know. And then he disables the glider, says that, and saves MJ. Yeah, and when it comes to, like, the one moment that always freaked me out as a kid was, I mean, the scene with Norman uh, talking to the darker side of his personality, which is, of course, the goblin. Mm Mm-hmm. The reflection in the mirror, kind of like a little Jekyll and Hyde scenario. Yeah, because Norman's Jekyll and the goblin is his Hyde. But it was uncanny. Yeah, and it's wonderfully conveyed by Defoe. Yeah, I mean, he's he's like two sides in one coin. You can do one back and forth all the way. Yeah, and yeah, the moment cool. with uh, when he attacks the bugle trying to track down Peter because, I mean, because of him providing photos for Spider-Man, mm-hmm. I've always liked the one moment where he's, where J, uh, where JJ pretends he doesn't even know who Parker is, I mean, because he's trying to protect him, not knowing that he's Spider-Man. And even around that point, if you ask me, going for Jameson, that says a little about his character right there. I mean, he's not entirely heartless, but it's like a very rare moment where... You think that he's this gruff, unbelievably stubborn editor, and believe me, at times he is. But at the same time, he does have a bit of a soft side that allows him to protect innocent people, even from something that gruesome. Oh, yeah. And and the one thing that has always bothered me was after the Green Goblin knocks out Spider-Man with his knockout gas and temporarily paralyzes him and offers Spider-Man a chance to join him as a, why doesn't he take his mask off? I mean, I I know I get the fact that he tries to get uh, Spider-Man to get him to join him, but he has the opportunity, even when he's holding him by his face, I'm like, why don't you just take his mask off to see who he is? And I actually took that into account a little while back and I realized that I think the answer to that question is you see a lot of times people have the opportunity to know who your villain is blah 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 or your hero or your adversary or whatever but the thing is at the time even though Norman viewed Spider-Man as sort of like an enemy as well as an opportunity he didn't necessarily want to know who Peter was or who Spider-Man was at the time, because he, at the time, I guess, didn't really see him as an enemy. He saw him as sort of like an opportunity and wanted to try to just, you know, make him an offer to join forces with him instead of trying to figure out who he is so he could kill him. Yeah. That, to me, is like the only possible explanation I can think of in all my years of experience with that character. Plus, a lot of times... The fact that you don't know who your adversary is supposed to be often makes the game a lot more interesting. Yeah, it definitely does. And another scene that I've always loved was, I mean, when uh, Peter rescues MJ again as Spider-Man from a a group of maybe rapists who don't Um, get their opportunity to commit their assault against um, MJ. Well, mainly just a bunch of thugs. Yeah. Obviously with bad intentions, but hard to tell. It's like 50-50 on that front. Guess it depends on the viewer. Yeah, but, I mean, you can clearly tell that they were trying to assault her, but, of course, Peter steps in. I mean, at first without his mask off, I mean, I'm, and I'm like, if, even if, I mean, and thankfully, I mean, he, his face is covered in shadow because, I mean, MJ could barely see him. And, of course, we get the famous upside-down kiss scene, which is one of the most romantic moments in cinematic history, in my in my opinion. Yeah, I, for one, thought that was quite the famous, like, scene in both comic book and movie. A lot of ways to go back. It's unbelievable. Yeah, and apparently Tobey Maguire was not really comfortable with that because he couldn't breathe, because, I mean... Uh, the mask was just up to his nose uh, when Kier- uh, Kirsten Dunst was pu- pulling the mask uh, up and down off his face, and he could barely breathe, especially with water like dripping down on d- uh, down on them. Yeah. And they, so the mo- the moment where he could breathe is that he uh, right after 
uh, Kirsten Dunst was done in Kissing Him. Uh, and I think that uh, Kirsten Dunst is a very good, believable Mary Jane, and sh she and Toby have great chemistry. Yeah, I cannot deny that. And one of my favorite moments in the film is the burning building scene with uh, with uh, Spider-Man's uh, next fight with the Goblin. It, this time with him using the razor bats. Mm -hmm. And the slow motion effect with Spider-Man dodging the blades, I've always loved that. And that's one of the few times where the visual effects actually hold up. Yeah, I for one very much enjoyed that. I tried to replicate that scenario a few times not like the burning building thing but like you know the stunts that spider-man did in the uh, in the actual scene when he was dodging the razor bats because i wanted to try to be uh, at least relatively fast in that department really was an interesting scene on that front. yeah but of course the uh, fights ends with spider-man getting cut and and of course it leads to the moment of where everybody's getting together for Thanksgiving, and right when that's when Norman figures out, I mean, by Peter's cut, the, I mean, and it was the exact cut that, that uh, Spider Man got from one of his razor bats that Spider Man, I mean, that Peter Parker is Spider Man. And after he figures that out, I mean, he just has to like get up and go before the goblin part of himself takes over completely. Well, uh, that's that's what I've always thought. And I think maybe that it might have something to do with it, but at the same time, it, it also... It was also the shock. Yeah, he probably just couldn't believe who the adversary actually was, and he just uh, needed sp time to process. It might have been the overall shock of the experience. In yeah, addition. and especially since throughout the movie, I mean, he appreciates uh, Peter mostly because of his intelligence and sees him as the son he never had because, I mean, there's obviously uh, some problems between him and Harry... Yeah. When it comes to comic book accuracy on that front, that's actually pretty accurate as well, because in the comics I've read, Norman most of the time never really cares about Harry, despite being his father and all. And I thought that carried over well to the whole thing. He shared a natural interest with Peter because of the great level of intelligence. Like yeah. Something he wanted in Harry, but he apparently never could get. Yeah. While well, Harry's always trying to impress him, but he's too blind by his own work to see him. Yeah. Yeah, that's definitely one way to put it. And when uh, when we get that one moment where Norman is taken over by the Goblin's influence to attack uh, Peter by attacking his heart, and in this case attacking those who are close to him, he targets Aunt May first by, I mean... Uh, the goblin, he blows up a large chunk of her house and uh, leaves her in severe shock. Yeah. And that's when Peter finds out that he knows that he's Spider-Man. Yeah. It's... That's what makes the Green Goblin, in my opinion, the best... I mean, uh, the greatest enemy for Spider-Man because... I mean, since he's, I mean, and even in the comics, he was the first villain to ever find out Spider-Man's secret identity, and the best way for him to hurt Spider-Man is by attacking those who are close to him. Yeah, I think, at least for this film, they really picked a winner out for him. It could have been just about any one of them, Vulture, Sandman, or any of the other guys, really. But starting out with the Green Goblin, in my opinion, was a really good idea. Well, fun fact, I mean, there were originally supposed to be two villains for the movie. There was going to be Green Goblin, and of course, uh, there was going to be, uh, there was going to be Green Goblin, and then there was going to be Doc Ock. Ah, uh, yes, but they carried him over to the second one. I can see why they'd want to do that. Keep it short and sweet. Oh, yeah. And there's one thing I forgot to mention about the Green Goblin, because, I mean, about his design, because, I mean, I already commented on how silly the outfit is, but... When you look at the other concepts that we have here, I mean, and especially what they were originally going to do, it was a hybrid of animatronics and makeup. And I really like that design a little bit, and I'm saying just a tad bit more than the one that we got in the movie because it's a much more closer in design to the comic. Yeah, I can see why in a few occasions, but like I said before, you know, it just... I guess it really just depends on the viewer. When it comes to the old concept designs, they all have potential. The one we settle on is usually the one we get, but we just try to make the most of whatever we can. Yeah. It, it varies, really. Now, when it comes to uh, 
the the one moment when uh, with Peter in the hospital with Aunt May, who is played beautifully by Rosemary Harris, and think well, surprisingly, she's still alive. Yeah, I read actually somewhere a few days ago that. Like Brevin said, she is still very much alive, but she's like 93 years old. Yeah. Unbelievable. And she was in her late 70s when she played Aunt May. Yeah, and I, for one, think that's a great privilege. You know, not too many people reach that age. So that in itself is an accomplishment. Oh, yeah. And when she, uh, she discusses uh, Peter about MJ, she that's that gives Peter an idea that she might be the Goblin's next target. Yeah. And, of course, uh, the Goblin does kidnap MJ. And, of course, we get the big battle at the at the end. I mean, starting off with the bridge. But uh, with, uh, with the Goblin carrying MJ on one hand and a, a, a tram car full of kids uh, on the other, forcing Spider-Man to choose which one to save. And if anybody who's familiar with the comics, uh, this is supposed to be a big uh, nod to when the Green Goblin killed Gwen Stacy. And mm. that's easily one of the most shocking deaths in comic book history. Yeah. And I'm glad that they don't kill Mary Jane in, in this scene. And, and I think if they did, and even when I was a kid, I'm, and they did do that, that would have really pissed a lot of people off. And... Yeah, personally, I think that had they decided to do that, we probably would have just ended Spider-Man right then and there. However, at the same time, while that could be a nod to Gwen Stacy's death, I think that is what they were going for. But if some of you have also read, like, a few comic books later, Goblin also tried to do the same thing with MJ in another comic, took her back to that bridge, and asked Peter if it looked like something familiar they already went through. So it's possible that during that time they either could have based it off that time or based the comic book off that point in the movie. So it, it, it might be a multi-purpose sort of thing. Yeah, and they even do that in the 90s cartoon. Oh. Yeah, the, the episode was when the Goblin came back and MJ pretty much falls off the bridge after he tries to do it for the same reason because she's someone that Peter really cares about to make him pay and she falls through a wormhole. Yeah. But yeah, there's a lot of different scenarios that could apply to. I like yeah, but I'm, yeah, but like I said, I'm glad that they didn't kill MJ in this. Yeah, me either. The only complaint I think that I really had about Kirsten Dunst at some point, and I'm pretty sure some of you might have had that too, is that a lot of times whenever she's in danger or she's kidnapped or whatever, her constant screaming can sometimes be a little obnoxious or just, <laughs> or just annoying, you know? Well, I, I thought the same thing too, but, I mean, she's often the damsel in distress character in, this, in these movies. Of course. It's just, uh, I don't know, maybe it just seemed a little too high-pitched screaming for me. But, yeah. but it really s sold the whole thing for the trilogy. I was glad they decided to stick with her. Yeah, and... Uh, right when Spider-Man saves uh, both MJ and the tram full of kids, uh, even when the Goblin tries to try to kill Spider-Man with his glider, I mean, uh, they even have like I mean the New Yorkers on the bridge trying to support Spider-Man. I really like that moment. It's really inspiring. Yeah, they often said in that part in the movie, it's a lot of symbolic how they really have come to appreciate all Spider-Man has done. And they said, hey, I got something for you there. You mess with Spidey, you mess with York. You mess with one of us, you mess with all of us. <laughs> yes. And when it comes to the final fight between Spider-Man and the Green Goblin, it's really brutal. And a large chunk of the fight, I mean, how it starts off with, is with the Green Goblin kicking Spider-Man's ass. Yeah, that's pretty much the only way to really describe it at first, because... Right before they started fighting, the Goblin basically threw Spider-Man through a wall into an abandoned house, crashed him through a window, and then threw a bomb right into his face that destroyed most of his costume and hit him straight through a brick wall. Yeah, and he just starts beating him to a pulp. 
Yeah, he's just got him completely subdued like a spider without webs that can't go anywhere else. Even when he tries to subdue the goblin with his webbing, I mean, he's still getting his ass kicked. Yeah, it bought him about two seconds, but even around then, he still overpowered him. Yeah, and even when the one moment where the goblin is gloating about killing MJ slowly, that gives uh, Spider-Man to regain like his, his power and give him a bit of a rage moment, which I've always loved. Yeah. Yep. And, of course, that gives him an, an advantage to overpower the goblin. And I'm just like, yes, yeah. do not stop. Just yeah, kick gro- his ass. Yeah, growing up, I really I dealed with that moment because, you know, things for me were a little tough back in the day. And I often felt like I was kind of weak, couldn't handle myself, didn't really know what to do. And that scene for me kind of helped realize that even when someone's got you beat, you can still do it. And I could, even going back through that film, I felt like I could really feel Spider-Man's rage and the ability to keep going came right off that scene. It was unbelievably awesome and just plain brutal. He not only stops the trident, throws Goblin straight to a wall trips him up, and then drops a brick wall on top of him. And, and after that, he swings towards him, slams him to another wall, and just, just starts beating the shit out of him. Yeah, and he just doesn't stop until Norman gets back in control for a few minutes. And, and reveals his identity. Him. And, of course, Peter's completely shocked. And right when Norman's trying to talk to Peter and ask him for forgiveness, at the same time, while under the Goblin's influence, tries to impale Peter with his glider... Yeah. Which, for the record, for those wondering what that might be, my best guess is the way that he was planning to do that might have been the fact that he wanted to beat Spider-Man at any cost, even if it meant killing them both at the same time. I could kind of see that scenario, but it didn't go the way he planned. He gave quite the speech, in my opinion, but at the same time, it just really... You could kind of see right through it after he pressed the button, you know? It's great. It's it's really great, and I really like how it was just instant karma at the end that really finished him off. But at the yeah, same time, I mean, you know, you just you kind of see through the ruse at this point. Yeah, and you know. his spider sense was like that was like one of the few moments. I mean, it, it's honestly one of my favorite moments where his spider sense is actually useful for him, especially when the glider is about to impale him and he dodges. I mean, he flips over and, and, and impales the goblin instead. Yeah. And basically right after that, the last thing that he told Peter to do was don't tell Harry. I... About um, him being the Green Goblin. Yeah. And of course, I mean, Harry assumes incorrectly that Spider-Man killed him. Yeah, and he basically tries to have him at gunpoint, but he gets away a second later. Yeah, and he vows vengeance against Spider-Man. And it leads to this... Uh, this one great moment but at the same time very sad moment where we get uh, uh, with Peter and MJ together right after uh, MJ kisses Peter he rejects his, uh, her advances because she he doesn't want to put MJ into harm's way and that I think is really heartbreaking and after that moment she recognizes that kiss that she just gave Peter and it reminds her of the same one that she gave Spider-Man which gives her I mean which leads her to suspect that Peter and Spider-Man are one and the same. Yeah, I personally don't think that she actually figured it out at that point, but I think that, like Brevin said, perhaps maybe she uh, like began to suspect that he was Spider-Man, and right after that, as he's walking away, it gives like, the best speech I can think of. The whole idea being that Whatever life holds in store for him, he would never forget the words Uncle Ben told him, that with great power comes great responsibility. And that this was his gift, his curse. Who is he? He's Spider-Man. And we get that uh, that one uh, scene with him swinging through the city and uh, accepting his responsibility as Spider-Man. And it's one of my favorite final swinging moments, I mean, with him, like, swinging through the city. And it's one of my favorite of the visual effects outside of the burning building moment. Yeah. I personally enjoyed it quite a lot because it was a lot of gymnastic moves, a very interesting way to 
take off the ground, but especially when he landed on the American flag, that's symbolization right there. Oh, yeah. But personally, I think I enjoyed the final swing in the second yeah. film just a bit more. Yeah, because, I mean, it's more of a happy ending. And I do love that a lot more than the one that we got in the first film. Mm -hmm. Plus, Danny Elfman's score in that one scene I really, really, really love. Yeah, I mean, his music, in my opinion, if you did another film to try to rate everything great about the movie. I think that the music in it, provided by Danny Elfman, will always be a win. No um, what so, uh, overall thoughts on Spider-Man. It's a film that I grew up loving as a kid, and I still think it holds up even to this day. A few minor issues here and there, mostly because of some effects looking a bit dated. But still, when it comes to its performances, its action sequences, and its attempts to treat the source material with respect in Sam Raimi's direction, and a great score by Danny Elfman. I think that this is a good movie that really holds up, and it's a pretty important film for comic book movies, especially, I mean, right around the time when they were mostly viewed as a joke. Hmm. Blade and X-Men gave some bit of life uh, into the superhero genre, but Spider-Man was the biggest boost yeah, for that. He was, as one might say, a real game-changer. He definitely is, and I'd definitely say give this a watch if you haven't seen it, or or even haven't watched it in years. I mean, it's still fun to watch even to this day, and I'm really surprised that I still love it even to this day, and since it's a childhood favorite of mine, it will always have a place in my heart, so that's definitely Spider-Man for me in a nutshell, and I'm going to give Spider-Man an A-. minus. <laughs>